This is a video about the coronavirus responsible for the 2020 global pandemic, COVID-19. Before we begin, I'd like to clarify that COVID-19 is the disease state, and the actual infective agent is SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. In the same way as AIDS is the disease state where the infective agent is HIV. SARS-CoV-2 is a bit of a mouthful, so we shall hereby refer to it as the coronavirus. The coronavirus comprises a single strand of RNA, which is the blueprint for how to make a coronavirus, inside a membrane with some proteins in it. These spiky proteins look a little like a crown under an electron microscope, which is presumably why it's called a coronavirus, corona being the Latin for crown or wreath. Coronaviruses are very small, less than 0.2 micrometers in diameter, which is 0.0002 millimeters. That is, 5,000 of them would fit into one millimeter, the smallest division on a ruler. To put that into context, a bacterium, E. coli here for instance, which resides in all our guts, is 5 micrometers long, and a human pneumocyte, the cells that make up your lungs, is 9 micrometers wide. There are actually two types of pneumocytes. Although type 2 only makes up 10% of the cells that line your respiratory surfaces, these are the ones actually infected by the coronavirus. In terms of volume, therefore, about 90,000 coronaviruses would fit into a single type 2 pneumocyte. So if you were a coronavirus, a human cell would be the size of Wembley Stadium. For the purposes of this animation, we're going to scale up our coronavirus. You can see that viruses lack a lot of the structures that you'd find in a human cell, or indeed any cell, including other animal cells, bacterial cells, yeast cells, and so on. Importantly, they have no ribosomes to make proteins, and hence to reproduce themselves. In fact, we might say that viruses are not really alive given that they can only replicate inside other cells. In other words, they are obligate intracellular parasites. To do so, however, it is not enough to be inside the lungs of the unfortunate host. They need to actually gain entry into its cells, which is not dissimilar to the walls of Winterfell being breached by an invader. This means finding a way to stick to the surface of the cell, which is where these proteins embedded in its membrane come in. It turns out that the spike protein has high affinity to a protein found on the surface of human lung cells called ACE2, which is analogous to a white walker scaling the outer walls of Winterfell after shooting an arrow into it. Once attached, the coronavirus fuses its membrane with the cell's membrane and disgorges its RNA into the pneumocyte. As we mentioned before, this is the coronavirus's genome encoding the blueprint for how to make a coronavirus. The coronavirus is a positive sense single-strand RNA virus. This just means that its genes are in a ready-to-translate format, the same format that human genomes use to send instructions to ribosomes, which are the cell's protein factories. So the virus is able to use the human's own resources to make further copies of itself. Sneaky. One of the first proteins to be translated by the ribosomes, or made by the cell's protein factories, is replicase, an enzyme which replicates the viral RNA, allowing it to massively scale up production of itself. This is rather like a franchise. Think of how ubiquitous the golden arches of McDonald's are, and you get the idea. The virus uses not only the cell's manufacturing capability, but its distribution network too. The proteins are secreted directly into the endoplasmic reticulum, packaged into the Golgi apparatus, and secreted fully formed with an envelope of the human cell's cell membrane ready to infect the next pneumocyte. Alas, so perversely impressive and efficient is nature. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to this channel so I can tell you more about the coronavirus, as well as human physiology in general. In the meantime, if you're interested in how lungs work, please have a look at the respiratory physiology course I have made with Dr. Matt Mason, University Physiologist at the University of Cambridge. Thanks for watching.